Paul. So hopefully we can uh, benefit if there's some, uh, some things we can go back and look at it. Um, uh, I'm really uh, excited to uh, have uh, Tim Irwin with us. Uh, I've known Tim for a long time. He's been involved in the tennis community for many, many years. Um, when I first came to the U.S. to play collegiate tennis at Temple University, Tim used to be the director at Aronimic Golf Club, where uh, my coach, Andy Sorrentino, was working. So I would spend a lot of time there. So I've known uh, Tim since 95. Um, and then Tim, uh, his son at that time was 10 or 11. We were just talking <laughs> earlier. And, um, you know, to his son is also a high performance coach, uh, works at out of Penn Oaks. Um, so Tim's been in the business for a long time. We were just talking about uh, West Town, how he played uh, tennis there as a kid growing up and whatnot. So um, I know all you, everybody who's been invited here, um, their kids are playing tennis and are at a good level or hope to play at a good level. And they have a chance to play competitive tennis and I wanted to see um, get some information out to you guys because sometimes college tennis people get think it's like a huge thing I mean yes there are different levels but there's a lot of opportunity that is out there that uh, parents are not aware of and um, and it can be a very daunting process just getting into a college is like a daunting process then thinking about playing like a collegiate sport can be really uh, a lot so if you guys have questions, whatnot, feel free to ask. What we will do is I'm going to have um, Tim do a, a brief bio about himself. And then um, I'm going to start off with some questions for Tim. And if you guys want to take some notes, feel free to do so. And then after we're done, we're going to um, do a few uh, Q&A. Um, and then we'll go from there. Feel free to raise your hand if you need to talk. Uh, Tim, are you there? I, I am. Fazl, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, terrific. Thanks very much for being with us today. Um, uh, you know, it was great to see your Facebook post about the stats uh, about uh, collegiate mm -hmm. tennis. And I want you to um, get started, uh, kick off this meeting, uh, uh, give a brief bio about yourself so the parents can understand uh, your background a little bit. And then we sure. can. Fazl, first, uh, thank you uh, so very much for um, letting me. Uh, uh, connect with your, your parents and uh, some uh, of, I guess, your associates and um, would really like to uh, take this time to, I hope, be a help to them in trying to help bridge this gap between high school tennis and college tennis. Um, I was very fortunate as we talked a little bit before um, getting started today, uh, where you are at at the Westtown School is where probably I, I really learned how to teach tennis. And it was because of my collegiate tennis coach, guy named of uh, Ron Woods um, was at Westchester university at the time and ran a, a, a program called the chase tennis center at West town, where we'd get a hundred kids in for four weeks. And then we get another hundred kids in. And uh, it was at that, that summer of 1977 uh, that I felt I had a profound uh, learning experience. Not only that, but then having a coach that was uh, had a, a huge impact. Well, um, about seven years ago, I got um, recruited by NSR to be a tennis scout for the northeast part of the United States. And I, I took it wholeheartedly. I, I wanted to see not only kids have this opportunity to get to good coaches in good programs with good academic schools, but at the same time, help parents save money. I saw it as a win-win for everybody. And uh, since that time, I, I've been able to help uh, a good number of kids, parents, et cetera. And I just want to continue to do this, probably hopefully do this till the day I die. So um, that kind of brings me here today and uh, would love to um, start the process of uh, talking with uh, you and, and uh, those who have attended today. Great. Um, so I um, wanted to uh, get back into some of the posts. Um, you know, why don't you talk about the post that you had shared with some of the stats? Okay. Um, is that now, is that the one that was uh, a share? I share so many of these posts. The, the one, uh, can you just up, bring me up to speed a little bit on the post? So I think uh, the post talked about how many uh, high schools are kids are playing high school tennis and what percentage goes on. To play. Oh, okay. Okay. Terrific. Um, yes. Uh, 
Well, you know, I, I, it was actually that morning I was reading the Wall Street Journal and, and it was saying uh, that 1,500 colleges um, were no longer accepting uh, for, for this coming year, the SAT, ACT as a requirement to get accepted. And that intrigued me because I was just talking with a parent on whether or not her child should go ahead and try to take the SAT because she had heard rumors of some of the colleges uh, that were passing on that due to the whole COVID situation. Um, that brought me up to saying, you know, I just want to share some more statistics with athletes and parents that, uh, you know, we have a term in the recruiting business called uh, uh, D1-itis. And it's where, you know, uh, a player who's playing number one, maybe all four years of high school is, is clearly in their head, they're going to go play D1. And the fact of the matter is, is if you're not really in the top 150 of, of kids in the country, D1 is a long shot. It's a real long shot. And yet those particular kids and parents can spend an awful lot of time looking at D1 schools. Meanwhile, they're burning valuable time for D2 and D3 schools where potential scholarship opportunities might be there. That kind of may, may launched me into um, bringing out that that uh, post that day. Before you go further, why don't we tell the parents how many different divisions are there available in college tennis? Sure. Um, well, we've got really three governing bodies uh, in collegiate uh, athletics. We have the, the, the one that's very commonly known, the NCAA, which has division one, division two, and division three. We also have something called the NAIA, which is another governing body. And then we also have uh, the, the, the NJCAA, which is for junior college. So there's those three different bodies. They all function on different set of rules, but um, focusing really on the NCAA, uh, there's three levels, division one, division two, and division three. And then you have the junior college and then NAIA. Correct. So there's really five levels that kids can go out and play. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes people are not aware of that. And many of the good para kids who are like you know, into the tennis world uh, don't know that there's a huge uh, choice essentially available, huge opportunity available. Um, the next question, uh, in amongst these uh, five levels, what, what kind of scholarships are available? Well, I think, you know, let's looking at the uh, NCAA, the, the most common, you have D1 that can provide, obviously, athletic scholarships and academic scholarships. This is the biggest schools in the country. They're going for the biggest national championships across the country. And these are for usually the top players in the country or around the world to get recruited, get sent here. And they're going for that national championship. Coaches typically are hired and fired based on their records. They're there full time as a tennis coach. And so it's, it's somewhat of a separate program. What I do want to share with your parents is uh, there is uh, enormous opportunities in D2 and D3 schools. Great academics, top of the line academics. You want to be a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, D3 schools provide unbelievable, good, solid education and have great track records for graduate schools. Um, but when you go to D2, D2 schools can give... Uh, smaller academic athletic scholarships because of limitations with their own budgets. And then D3 schools provide just academic scholarships, no athletic scholarships. The philosophy, uh, Fazel, of D3 versus the philosophy of D1 are miles apart. D1 schools, you're going there for one reason, basically is you're getting in on your athletics you're playing there to win, and the coach keeps his job because they're winning. In D3 schools, the philosophy is structured where it's academics first, athletics second, but typically the coaches there understand the bigger picture. You're here for academics. We're going to do everything we can to win our conference, et cetera, but they also are going to be um, more mindful of your academic stress. And I, I think that's an important piece where a lot of our kids can play D3, D2 level in, who, in your junior programs and other junior programs around the, around the middle states. 
I don't think coaches are emphasizing that enough. I mean, last year I had two boys that played just doubles in the Chestnut League. Both of them are now going to the schools they're going to because of tennis, but there's a D3 school. They qualified for huge academic money. Mom and dad could not have been happier. So it's something that tennis coaches really need to make sure that they're educated in this piece of the, of the puzzle. And that's hopefully, I, I hope that's where I can come in. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I agree with that. I mean, I personally have had uh, kids who've gone into D3 schools and I know people who played in D3, great academic programs and also really good tennis players. Um, and, you know, it was a really fulfilling experience. Uh, um, Brian Gordecki, who helped me, he was like, you know, he played at uh, Williams, which is a D3 school. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of other kids uh, who are not coming on the top of my head right now, but we've had a bunch of kids who've gone on D3 and done really well. Great academics, mm -hmm. now going to med school and whatnot. Now, would the D3 schools also have, they, they typically have academic money or do they have athletic money? Yeah, D3 schools uh, are not permitted to give athletic scholarships. So it's strictly academics. Okay. One thing of, of being in the scouting business these last seven and a half years, you know, one thing I've come across is uh, sit down with, with, with a young player and their parents and say, you know, can you tell me what your GPA is? I'm not surprised anymore when someone says, well, it's a 4-6. It's a 4-4. You know, you think, wait, I thought it was stopped at 4-0 with, with all of the um, uh, courses that kids can take now in high school that are advanced placement courses. They can bump that, that GPA up over 4-0. And so kids really need to know from their tennis coaches, they need to be working as hard in the classroom as they are on the court, if not harder, because those doors can open a lot of opportunities. When a dad sends me an Excel spreadsheet and says, look, Tim, I'm saving $120,000 over the next four years. And you look at that and you say to yourself, kid played doubles in high school. You would never have dreamt had he not have the right knowledge that the opportunities would have been there because he qualified academically. That's a huge point. Um, and then typically uh, is, uh, is the season pretty similar to what the D1, D2 schools are? Like, are there seasons all the same uh, time, same levels? You know, Fazo, it, it varies all over the country. Um, there's some, you know, where they're playing in the fall where they have a tournament schedule and then their matches are in the spring. Um, some don't have a fall schedule and they just play in the spring. You know, it, it's really based con conference to conference and what part of the country, which would make a lot of sense when you can have year round programs in the south where you can't have necessarily uh, that kind of hitting up in this area and we're, or New England. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, then one of the, you know, I, I'd written down a list of questions right at the top of my head. Obviously, uh, you know, some of it's obvious, but it's, it's still like, you know, it's good to go over like the benefits <laughs> of playing a team sport, you know. Oh, um, man. You know, me playing collegiate uh, tennis, one of the biggest things was, um, you know, I learned, uh, first of all, to work in a team environment. Uh, it was uh, definitely, uh, for the first time, you had like uh, basically six or seven friends, uh, albeit yeah. all from different parts of the world, which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you also learned leadership skills. You learn how to get along. You learn to practice mm -hmm. with each other. You also had like a emotional support because, you know, win or lose, you've got somebody to share that with, um, you know, the van rides were amazing. And uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, when we look back, like I'm done tennis. So uh, it's been many years, but those memories are uh, priceless. Uh, just uh, the van rides, you know, uh, the Thursday night van ride and, you know, coming back and getting back <laughs> on homework and trying to like, you know, get through, you know, cram through. So I think those were amazing. Uh, um, do, do you have any uh, good points uh, in terms of the benefits of playing uh, a sport like uh, at, uh, in college? Well, I, I, you know, I, I would concur with everything you just said. I mean, I could rattle off uh, our starting lineup when I was in college, and I'm still in touch with probably 90% of the guys that were on the team. I mean, these were lifelong friends. Um, the other thing, though, I think that, and that's a network, that's a whole networking piece, uh, but 
the other thing that, and I just posted this actually on my Facebook page today. And if anyone uh, would just type in Tim Irwin NSR, they'll go right to my Facebook page. But it was the percentage of NCAA student athletes who report that college athletics has had a positive effect on their personal responsibility, 93%. Teamwork skills, 92%. Work ethic, 91%. Leadership skills, 88%. Personal values, 87%. Self-confidence, 81%. Time management skills, 80%. Understanding of other races, 79%. Study skills, 68%. And commitment to volunteerism, 65%. I mean, to me, the, the question I pose is this. Do you think employers are interested in those qualities of, of kids? Absolutely. I mean, when an employer sees that someone play, was an NCAA athlete, in the mind of that employer, it's just going to check, 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 because he knows that that particular um, uh, applicant has been through a whole list of things that someone who just, say, went to college for academics only um, didn't have the chance to go through, let alone if they're got a reputation, the college has a reputation, or a coach has a reputation. The one question, Fazl, I would encourage all of the parents that are on and, uh, and coaches. I've learned this kind of through the process of elimination in my own experience. Um, big question has to come to a kid. You qualify for D3 level tennis. You qualify for some D2 level tennis, you don't qualify for D1. I'm sorry, I'm telling you what you need to know, not what you wanna know. But you know what? You get accepted to Princeton. You get accepted to Penn. You've got these other schools, coaches say, you're gonna play all four years. If you come to my school, maybe it's an Ursinus or maybe it's a Gettysburg, maybe it's, um, a Swarthmore, Haverford, great academic schools. They're not Ivy League. You just got into Ivy League. Where are you going to go? And what I have to go over with the parents and the kids is you really need to think through, do you want to get an education at a very prestigious institution and give up your tennis, at least for the next four years? Or do you want to go to a school where you're going to be able to play in all likelihood all four years and yet, at the, uh, excuse me, uh, and play all four years and get a secondary education as well as your primary education and graduate from a very, very strong academic school? Uh, talking about that, that, I think it's a really, really good point. Uh, wh where do you see... I mean, I have a somewhat of a idea, a fairly good idea in terms of that UTR. A lot of parents are now well uh, aware of what the UTR means. Uh, for those who don't know, UTR stands for Universal Tennis Rating. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something which is really catching on um, in the tennis world. I particularly follow it fairly, um, you know, because that's how I sort of measure progress with regards to my kids, uh, how they're going year to year. Um, you know. For a division one, like a top notch player, what's the UTR required? What are we seeing? Yeah. Um, I hate to be vague with you on this, uh, Fazo, but it's, you know, I have some D1 colleges that are, let's say, a little bit lower in terms of performance, where they could get beat by D2 or D3 schools. Um, but they're D1, which means they can give athletic money. 100%. Uh, I have some kids that I would say they're even like a seven and a half or an eight and they can play at that school. It's also the philosophy of the coach. Mm -hmm. Now you've got tougher schools where we sent a couple of kids say up to Quinnipiac and they were over a, like a nine, nine and a half um, in terms of their UTR. A lot of coaches will just say to me, Tim, we're looking at for a 10, 10 and a half right off the top for a D1 level, double figures for D1. Um, D2, a little bit, you know, you're around that eight and a half, say, you know, give or take maybe a point, point and a half either way. 
And then, D, you know, D3, based on the coach and his philosophy and what he's trying to achieve, he could still be up around the eights or the nines. But you can go sometimes as low as a four or five. You know, the UTR system goes from one to 16, and it's global. I mean, every player, Nadal, uh, Djokovic, they've got a UTR. And yet, you know, and so do you, and so do I. And, um, and so it, it's, it's there. I can tell you, Fazel, when I uh, contact a coach and I'll say, hey, Pete, you know, I've got this really great kid. I really would like you to, you, you know, to, to meet them. And he says right off the bat, two questions. One, what's her UTR? And two, what's her GPA? Right off the top, because they, the coaches want to know right off the top is, is it, you know, is this going to be a waste of time? They can't even get in, get accepted. Or, you know, is this something that, you know what, I only got one spot open next year and this particular child, she's not going to be able to play six. So, you know what, I need to move on. Coaches don't have time to waste going through and trying to figure out what's best for your kid. They're trying to figure out what's best for their program. And so you either give them something that's like golden that they can fight for. But if you give them something below that, they don't have time for it. Just yeah. like you or I, you know, they're busy working a full-time job. And so um, it, it, that's kind of, I hope that answers that question. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's an important point for, uh, you know, kids and parents to understand that you don't have to be a 12 U UTR to play college tennis, even at an eight or a nine, you can't <coughs> play with, uh, college tennis. And you were saying as uh, even at five and six, you're going to be able to play college tennis, which gives yeah. a lot of people are like, you know, don't just even get turned away if you're thinking they just can't do it, you know? Right. Um, it's a lot, a lot of it at the end of the day is like, you know, uh, personal motivation and uh, personal information. And it's important to know that, you know, kids can improve a lot, but as you go through, you don't like, uh, there are a lot of kids who turn, stop early on 15, 16, that oh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to college tennis. So I just don't even want to try anymore. Right. Whereas you can really keep moving along and, uh, and improve a ton. I wanted to, to talk to you the next part, but how does one get noticed by college coaches? Well, um, and when Fazel, does the process start? I mean, yeah, uh, let me let me share with you at least um, that the, the the process of recruiting that I think is a common understanding among parents, and I hate to say even some pros, mm -hmm. is stage one is identification. And the second stage is get the offer. And a lot of kids think as long as a coach knows me, I'm going to be getting a scholarship. And I'd have to say that's the farthest thing from the truth. There's literally not two stages in recruiting. There's four. And the two that are missing that I just mentioned are the ones that are most important. Identification, you know, a, a coach can find a, a player through lists, through the U.S., you know, you know, in tennis, compared to some guys like football or baseball or basketball, the USTA has done a wonderful thing by giving us rankings. The UTR system has given us this number where we have got a good feel of, of what a player can play at what level. And so a coach can find these things just by going on Google, and they can get identification. Now, just to give you an example, Auburn University – has a, a limited number of scholarships, but they send out about 2,500 letters of interest. And if a young person gets a letter from Auburn and it says how interested they are, that child might think they're going to Auburn. One of the things they have to realize is that coach may not even know their name. That may have been kicked out from the, the athletic office or a, a, an assistant coach just saying that that coach had some interest when he pulled a list of of kids. The most important thing that a, a, a young person needs to know is this when it comes to recruiting. If you're not talking face to face with a coach, you're not being recruited. Next question. No yeah. uh, when can a kid connect with a coach? Uh, sure. You know, information can be sent to a kid in terms of communication like that at any time. However, a face-to-face -face meeting or to talk to that, co that, that player after they play a match 
it, the, the big hot date that every parent needs to remember and coach is June 15th after their sophomore year. Now, Fazo, a real, real important thing for parents to understand. Do people think that coaches are waiting until that kid's June 15th of his sophomore, after his sophomore year that they're going to actually start recruiting that kid? No way. They, they are looking for information. They're following that kid. In fact, when I talk to my, my prospects, if you can almost picture a whiteboard behind me and a good college coach has up here on, on the left side, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, and they're putting names of kids that they're interested in all those particular years. We're going all the way down to eighth grade. And, and as those, as information comes out, as reports come out, as anything posted by the USTA, anything on Facebook, anything anywhere that can be an asset to that particular player, that coach is bringing in. When June 15th hits, that's like a lot of the recruiting is already done. They want that particular player and they're going to start talking to them right away. That's why for, for in terms of a lot of parents think, well, you know, we'll start this process in our junior year. It's too late. It's too late. They really need to start earlier. That's an important point. Uh, one of the things like, you know, as we prepare, um, you know, as coaches and uh, parents, like we need to have a three, four year timeline, maybe longer to saying to give ourselves the best chance of making sure the kid can play uh, uh, college tennis because mm -hmm. the other thing is this is for the parents to think a lot of times kids the rate of improvement changes over time mm -hmm. right so as long right. as you are sort of have a reasonable goal right some kids will improve very quickly although mm -hmm. they may be slow in the beginning so if you mm -hmm. have a four or five year timeline and you say hey listen i need to get to a 10 UTR, okay, and you're only at six, mm -hmm. you want to keep trying to keep working because you don't know how you may improve a year two to year three versus year one to year two, you may be slow because your fundamentals are still weak, mm -hmm. right? And two and three, you can certainly move a, a lot. Mm -hmm. But thinking like that, I mean, a lot of everybody here has um, young kids. I think some of them, uh, I think sophomore is probably a couple of them. I think mm -hmm. Ben is, Ben Jr. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a junior. Yeah, so like, like all these guys, I want them to have that mindset that like you know I want to start looking out early on, two mm -hmm. years, three years on out, that I want to be able to play. And what do I? Need? There are some people here who are much younger, and I've have them because I also want the parents to start thinking like you know the reason I have you is because I think your kids are pretty good and they can get on better over like you know if you're nine years old, you have seven years to develop and you have a lot mm -hmm. of time. But it's good to have some goal that like, you know, you're going to play and go on to like, you know, hopefully help you get to get academics and then go on to becoming very successful. One of the things which many people don't know, I worked in investment banking for a few years. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, and so I actually played professional tennis and I came back. I finished the, the top of my class and then I uh -huh. got uh, a job for a top uh, bank where uh, trading derivative swaps. Uh -huh. so, what was interesting was when I went into my interview and I was expecting this heavy math uh, questions in the interview, it was all tennis. <laughs> I was kind of like, yeah, I was like, wow, these guys are talking to me about how I dealt with pressure and how uh -huh. I manage time. Uh -huh. and what did I did when I had made mistakes and things like that. So um, that was my first time when I kind of like realized the value of mm -hmm. collegiate tennis and, you know, one of the other things that I wanted uh, to share with parents is I went to Temple, which is not even top 100 in NCAA Division I. Mm -hmm. And I played professional tennis from there on. So when I talk to people who are in the tennis business, they know what an achievement that was. Because a lot sure. of people yeah. top 10 don't go play professional tennis. Right. Talk right. about your personal motivation. Like if you're personally motivated, you can, you can keep improving and go on as far as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want to make sure my... Uh, kids uh, like my students i uh, call them <laughs> i do care like i want to see them really excel and succeed because that's what we're our legacy is going forward like yeah, yeah, yeah. So i really appreciate you coming out and uh, sharing this information i think it's valuable um i'll open the floor to parents if they have any questions um uh, any points they want to make feel free to uh, jump in 
Uh, so can I just clarify one thing that I did say that I, I, I find it's very important for parents to know? Yeah. Would that be all right? Um, I had shared that most people think that the process of recruiting is identifying and then the, you get the offer. But that two other stages that are between the offer and identification, the second is evaluation. And you know, tennis gets coach's eye, but the character of the player is what gets them the scholarship. That's a great point. And, and that is such an important piece. That's why coaches want to know about that player up as much as they can find out up to June 15th after their sophomore year. That's why they're recruiting. They want to find out even things like, do they volunteer in their community? Are they involved in their uh, school in other areas outside of tennis? Do they have balance in their life or are they just a tennis ball? I mean, all these things are so important to the evaluation process. And then it gets to stage three, which is ultimately the most important part of recruiting. And that's the comparison phase. When a coach says, I have two spots left, but he's got 12 kids on his list. And he knows as he goes down that list that there's certain kids that are gonna, not gonna be able to, 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 to cut it. He, it's gonna open doors, but he's gonna be looking for grades. He's gonna be looking things like, are they gonna get homesick? Um, are, are they gonna need a tutor? Are they going to be out partying Friday and Saturday nights? And so when we go through this, the one thing that we do um, ask our kids that, that we that get involved with NSR is, you know, are you going to be staying away 100% from drugs, from alcohol? And then the most important new detrimental thing is negative social media posts that kids can put on their Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat accounts, things like these things have basically short circuited scholarships for kids. And they have to know, I mean, it's, I, I got to just say, parents, you got to be involved in that aspect of their life. I think that's a huge point. I was just reading something about it. And, uh, you know, uh, with the advent of social media, uh, I think kids are under a huge pressure. Mm -hmm. And also like, you know, a, a short moment of irresponsibility can really, uh, you know, ruin that kid's future. Um, and we really need to be vigilant about that. Um, I think those are great points. Uh, Amar, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm good, yeah. <laughs> um, anybody, if they have a question, uh, feel free to ask or, um, you know, feel free to point out anything that you feel like uh, would be beneficial. Dave, did you have a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, Tim, very nice to meet you. Hi, Dave. Uh, I, I, I guess I was, no, I've, I, You've described the recruiting process. Right. I don't have a sense for uh, how colleges uh, make up uh, their tennis teams and how many kids they have uh, on the teams. You, you know, when, when you go to something yeah. like the, the UTR site, you can sort of see the top players. But are, are most of these uh, colleges looking at having, you know, seven on the team playing because that's it <laughs> yeah. or are they looking for 12 or 14 and yeah. saying, you know, here are the ones we're going to play every year. Here are the ones who work toward your senior year, even though we're going to be recruiting again. What, yeah. what's Dave, Dave, like? You know, Dave, there's just, not, there's just not one correct answer for that. It deals so much with the philosophy of the coach. I have, I, I know some college coaches that if a kid comes out for that team, he's going to keep them. Because his philosophy is, I want to help this young person have this aspect in their life for the rest of their life, tennis. And he's a teacher. Then you have another coach that it's, look, I want bare minimum. I just want to win. And so I just want the cream of the crop. And if they can't hit with my top three players, they're not going to be able to play on the team. So it, it, it really varies a lot. And that's one of the things of having an advocate who can get to know the coach or know the coach's philosophies in advance where a child doesn't end up getting accepted to the school, loves the school, and then gets on the tennis team and goes, I hate this coach. This guy is terrible. I'm quitting. And yet the whole focus was for him to play collegiate tennis. He ends up with a, a kind of a, a lemon of a tennis coach. And, they're, uh, and believe me, they're out there. That's a really good point. Um, Dave, my experience typically, um, I played at Temple. So we would have about um, 
eight kids on the team, the higher uh, you go up, if the coaches have more money, they'll probably carry 10 or 12 and then they'll have a, like a backdrop. It varies. Like Tim said, um, like, you know, so it really, the, it, there's at least like eight to nine spots. I mean, if you're a really strong walk-on, I've seen people make the team. Um, and I have what Tim said. It's very, very important. I know a bunch of guys. Uh, I know somebody who worked for me. He was number one in the state, state champion, went to an Ivy League school after freshman year, quit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, this kid was really good. I mean, he could have played anywhere in the U.S. And he quit tennis after his freshman year because he just couldn't deal with the coach. And it's very, very important. I, I like my advice to my kids who've gone on is like, first thing is look at academics, your coach and your teammates, because they will tell you a lot about how people will treat you there. And more important is like, not just like say the program, but whether you're playing one or two or three, it's like um, the coach's philosophy. Is he there to groom you, help you, uh, enable you, or is he just trying to fill a spot? And a lot of times what happens is if you're, if you go to a coach who just wants to win, if you win, he treats you really well. If you lose, he doesn't treat you well. And that's a huge emotional piece on a kid. Mm -hmm. And that affects everything else around him. But if a coach is like, Hey, listen, Ben, I see you down the road as becoming this person on the team. And let's see, we got to improve your backhand a little bit. We got to get your second serve going a little bit. I really see you becoming a great doubles player. So I'm working to develop that kid. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of coach you want to be around. And plus also the teammates will say a lot, you know, it's so like, hey, uh, what's the coach like? And you can see the body language of the coach is like, oh, he's tough, man. He's just brutal. Like, you know, he's like, you know, like they will let you know, talking to the uh, teammates mm -hmm. is very, very critical is what's important to the coach, how they behave, what kind of, like, is he okay with kids cheating to win? And mm. believe me, that some will be. And is he like, you know, he's going to, if somebody tells me that coach just kicked out that kid because he was treating, behaving improperly, I'm like, that's the kind of coach you want to be around because he's just making sure you're the right kind of person. So for me, like, you know, the, the character piece is huge. Um, at the end of the day, like, you know, we're really building people who will go on to be hopefully great citizens of this country and the world at large. And we are, you know, providing really that, I mean, you know, everybody can hit a ball, but like, it really is like what kind of human beings we're going to put, put forward. So it's really important to, I think, talk to the players around because they are going to tell you what the coach is about. Hmm. Yeah. Very good. Anybody else, any other questions? Hey, this is Arvin here. Hey, Arvin. How Welcome. are you? Good, good. Hey, now, this is really good. Uh, appreciate uh, both you, Fazal, and Tim for taking the time, uh, you know, when things aren't as rushed <laughs> in oh, our right, lives, right, especially yeah. holiday season. Uh, I have a question. This year has been quite a ride for, you know, the entire universe here, right? Mm -hmm. And recognizing the fact that things had been put on hold or been stopped in many places. <clears throat> uh, I have seen and uh, read some reports where the funding for different sports in different colleges have either been completely taken away <clears throat> or been scaled down significantly, thereby impacting many programs. I'm talking about the, you know, the top universities in the country, right? I'm talking about Stanford, you know, uh, which has got an amazing program for all kind of uh, all kinds of uh, events, mm -hmm. right? As an example, <clears throat> and I hear uh, things can take a different turn. And what are your thoughts? And what are you seeing, Tim? And how how do you think this might turn out? Yes. Um, well, Faz and I were actually uh, talking about this uh, prior to today's meeting, and. Um, it's happening everywhere, all over. I mean, there's kid. I have to say that the the 2021 kids who are going to graduate in 2021, they've got a they've got a rough hand that they were dealt. Um, there's schools that they were planning on going to have dropped their tennis program. All of a sudden, they've got to resurrect a new turn. They've got to find either another school, or that's been like, hey, I don't want to do that. That's a whole new hurdle they have to jump. The other is that funding has really been hit hard. 
And so a lot of schools, um, you know, they're just, the whole program, because of football isn't going to be played it's been hit the whole budget and so tennis is one of those unfortunately on the budget that doesn't contribute a lot in terms of asset financially they can just check it off let's get rid of that at least that's going to save us a little bit here um it's a concern but then again like uh there's other schools that uh they're solvent financially especially d3 universities and because they're private and, and they are, you know, like uh, I was just talking with a, um, a coach the other day. He said, Tim, we just put $15,000 back into our tennis program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying, you got to be kidding me. And he says, no, he said, we're, we're in that posture. So one of the things that's, that's, especially at this juncture, is to be able to contact enough coaches for a particular player so that you really get an honest evaluation of what's out there. Because right now, uh, some of the horror stories can make somebody think that's what it is across the board. And it is not. Mm. There are schools out there for kids that are still fine. The tennis programs are fine and, and, and they're doing well. But some of the bigger schools, um, Fazel, uh, I wasn't aware of the school you mentioned earlier, Fazel, but do, would you want to share a little bit about that one university you were talking about? Uh, Minnesota? Yes. Yeah, so uh, to Arvind's point, uh, Arvind, we were just talking about, uh, you know, uh, how some of these top schools with this top 10 programs got cut. Minnesota, um, I know a friend of mine went there and, you know, he was the uh, top 10 in the country. They just cut their program. Uh, so th there are things that are happening. So like what happens is we take a blanket approach. It's like it's going bad across the uh, picture. And then that may not be the case. Uh, unless you're looking to go to Minnesota, but like there's a lot of schools which are available and, you know, there's plenty of money mm -hmm. and actually available where, you know, kids are going to be able to play. What's interesting was I was looking at this um, one little stat here and I don't know if I can find it, but it basically uh, in Pennsylvania, there are 90 colleges which offer tennis programs and in New York, it's 90 in Maryland. It's like uh, 24. 20 or 20, uh, New Jersey is 26. Maryland is about another 20. So between from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, if your kids just want to even stay local, you have over 200 schools which offer tennis at different levels. Right. At different <laughs> levels. But your kid can play tennis. They can put on their resume, I graduated with this degree and played team sport. And maybe if you're Fortunate, you say, like, I was team captain or whatnot, because now you've got like a leadership block on your thing. The guy looks at you and said, oh, this kid was a captain and played NCAA sport, right? So I, I think a lot of times we really have to, there's not enough information out there. So we really wanted to get this chance to get you guys some of this information, which even I myself, you know, when my friend told me Minnesota got cut, I was like, wow. And then you you hear the other side. No, no, there's still other programs have to you know, I mean if you go to like a Swarthmore or Haverford, it's like you know the brain trust of America, and you <laughs> and you got you got no problems academically. It's unbelievable, and yeah, you know they're just fine. Yeah. 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 Th thank you. Pleasure. You bet. You bet. Anybody else? Um, I think that was really good. I uh, appreciate your time today, Tim, and um, oh, everybody pleasure. else who took their uh, time out uh, on a weekday, although it, the whole time it feels like a weekend now, <laughs> at least for me, it's just, uh, I've never not worked for this long. But uh, did you have another question, Arvind? Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, one other question. Uh, I also recently read that uh, we're going through a a transition here to the nationalized uh, ranking system, right? A more consistent ranking basis across all states in the country. Because if uh, if people are, you know play in other states, their system of ranking is different from what we have in Philadelphia or in the middle states. <clears throat> yeah. Now, how does that come into play in the way people? look at things i don't know if it's going to have a change or are the coaches going to be looking more at how people play or how is the transition going to be looked at if there's going to be one 
Tim, I'll let you go first, then I'll give you. But Faza, I'll be I'll be frank. I've heard about this. I I'm not very schooled in exactly how it's going to be be laid out. Um, to answer, uh, is it Ar Arvin? Yes, Arvin. Arvin. To answer your question, um, this is where I'd have to say it's very important for that particular player to have an advocate on behalf. I have, you know, most coaches realize, especially with the COVID that the UTR may not be as accurate because the kids haven't played. Mm -hmm. So they haven't been able, I mean, a UTR is supposed to compute the last 30 matches. Well, when, 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 when was the last 30 matches over a, maybe a year ago? Right. So, so that, that is where uh, the possibility of an advocate, a scout per se, someone like myself can actually speak on behalf of not only the tennis abilities of, a, of that player, but also their character. And that's kind of where a coach is really trying to dive deep. He wants to know, like, wh where's this particular kid at? And their tennis really is the door opener. But after you get through that door, you're getting <laughs> into the meat of, you know, what's his work ethic? How's it, you know, how's his grades? And you, and you, and, and digging that, that deeper dive is more important actually that helps that, that, that's a really i apologize I, I just don't know enough about that new system um, I, i've read i've read briefly about it it's not still out I, mean, I think the reason what they're doing this is um so there would be so somebody plays in florida or texas versus somebody's competing in pennsylvania or new jersey they were gonna be like the kids in florida and texas are much better because their mm -hmm. level of competition is much better and what happens also is like California also in one of those like hot seats where like it also what happens is the UTRs can be off also a little bit because I've seen UTRs from Texas and UTRs from Pennsylvania. They have the same UTR, but the level can be different. Right. right? So That's exactly there, right. Yeah. So what happens is they're trying in a way to see if they can like make it like, so people don't think, okay, this kid not that good just because it's from Pennsylvania. You can say, oh, mm -hmm. you know, apples to apples, he's somewhere around here. Uh, I don't know how they're going to go about it, but that's what they're trying to do. But I think a lot of it, you know, for college tennis is really the connection of the player to the coach mm -hmm. and the culture that he's happy with and is going to work for. And I think that's a really good point, knowing like, you know, this kid is going to be an investment, you know, and you, the coach looks at the kid as an investment and, and the kid thinks like he's going to go into this program, he's, he's going to thrive they're going to help him build, you know, I mean, and, you know, I've seen amazing things happen in college and I've seen terrible things happen in college. I've seen some mm -hmm. unbelievably talented people completely quit. And you're like, yeah. why? And you're like, I just don't want to be around my teammates. I don't want to be around yeah, the yeah. coach. I just don't want to do anything with these guys. And then there are people who you would thought like, we're not that good. And suddenly they're like, they're in this productive environment. Um, I think it's very, very important. Uh, the college and the teammates make a big part of it. Like, you know, um, I, I'm not a big uh, proponent of the name where you're going, but I'm more uh, mm -hmm. of the actual service, the product. Like, is the education good? Is the culture good? Is the money good? You know, so you got to pick. W w those are the three things that really matter because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're going to succeed if you have a good education and a good build because people will see it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Um, thanks very much, guys. It was really great. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, Tim, I appreciate you coming out. And um, My pleasure. My pleasure, Fazal. Would, Fazal, would I be able to just to share my contact information in case yeah, anyone yeah. would want to talk specifically about their particular child or player? Absolutely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, send an email out, and I'm going to let Dave Perfect. and Arvind. Uh, Dave, did you have a question first? No, 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 I just wanted to say thank you to both okay. of you. Oh. Thank you. And uh, Arvind, did you have a question? You're muted. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much. It's a great thank session. Um, so um, if um, no, I'll, I will send an email out to, uh, to everybody who is on the call with uh, Tim's information. Uh, Tim uh, does this. He's a professional. So if you guys are able to take his help, uh, 
you know, I recommend you take a look at him. His uh, bio will be uh, copied. I think I s s copied it on the, the original email. So feel free to, uh, you know, go through it and uh, you're welcome to reach out and see if there is a fit there and uh, if you guys can have the help. Um, once again, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we, uh, we are trying our best to make sure our kids have the best opportunities. Right. And uh, really we come from a, a point of service and uh, Tim comes from that same perspective. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. And um, we hope to do the best that we can and uh, wish all of you a very happy holidays and a very happy new year. Hope to see you guys soon. Yeah, yeah thank, you. Happy thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Dave. Thank you, Pazu. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure.